This is the rabbit hole iceberg. Google defines a rabbit hole as a bizarre, confusing, or nonsensical situation or environment. And this iceberg chart's got a lot of that. This iceberg chart has so much stuff on it, so much weird stuff on it, and that makes this iceberg chart kind of a hard thing to cover, because there is so much stuff you could potentially talk about. You could pick pretty much any single one of the entries on this iceberg and spend an entire video just talking about that one thing. There is that much going on here. So the way I'm going to do this is with each entry, I'm just going to give you a rundown of the most important ideas the most interesting aspects of the entry, and then move on. Obviously, I'm gonna spend more time on the more interesting entries and spend less time on the less interesting entries. And as you can see, I'm not gonna be able to cover this entire iceberg in just this one video. So this is gonna be part one of a multi-part series, probably. And let me tell you, while doing research on this iceberg, I found myself on some of the weirdest parts of the internet. And while browsing these weird parts of the internet, it's important to keep my online identity anonymous and for my personal information to stay safe. And that's where NordVPN comes in, today's sponsor. Did you know that your internet service provider can see pretty much everything you do online? It's true, records of everything you do online can be seen by your ISP, and bad actors and websites can easily track you by analyzing your internet traffic. The only way to really effectively protect your privacy online is by using a VPN such as NordVPN. NordVPN encrypts all of your internet traffic, making your online activity essentially impossible to track. Websites can no longer track you, your internet service provider can't tell what you're doing, and your privacy and personal information is kept safe. Since NordVPN can hide your online identity, it also has other uses, such as allowing you to access content and websites that are blocked in your country. Let's say that you want to use a website such as YouTube while in China. Typically, YouTube is blocked by the Chinese government in China, but by using NordVPN, you'll be able to hide your identity and location by setting your IP to a different country, the United States for example, and you can access YouTube just as if you were in the United States. Using NordVPN is also incredibly easy. After downloading the app on your PC, Mac, Android, or iPhone, just launch the app sign in and hit quick connect and you will be automatically connected to the most efficient and suitable server. In fact, if you act now, you can get a holiday season deal. If you go to nordvpn.com slash parallel pipes, you can get a two year plan plus one additional month with a huge discount. And before we get into this, I'm going to have to explain one more thing about how I'm going to approach this iceberg chart. So while doing research on this iceberg and working on this video, it came to my attention that the first two layers of this iceberg are not very interesting. I'd imagine that a lot of the people watching this video are already very familiar with a lot of the entries on the first two layers of this iceberg. Many of these entries have been covered to death on YouTube, and most of these entries lack anything interesting or dramatic or mysterious. And here's the thing, I think most people are coming to watch an iceberg video not to listen to someone talk about things that they're already familiar with, but instead to listen to someone talk about things that are new and fresh and have an air of mystery to them. So what I want to try and avoid doing here is making a video where you guys have to slog through boring entry after boring entry, just so every once in a while we can talk about something that's actually interesting. Interesting. And then right after that, we go back to boring entry after boring entry. And so here's what I did. I went through all the entries on the first two layers of this iceberg and blurred out of focus all the ones that are not worth our time. And so we're not going to spend any time on those ones. But then moving past these first two layers, we'll cover every entry. Oh my god, he's not going to talk about Flat Earth. That's my favorite one. Shut up. Take your complaints to the comments. There are so many interesting things on this iceberg that our time is not best spent talking about these entries. Okay, let's get into it. Pools closed. So this entry is referring to a meme that's related to the game game Habbo Hotel. Habbo Hotel is an online socializing multiplayer game. It's aimed at children. And in 2006, a couple groups on 4chan formed some raids where everyone chose this avatar and formed human blockades to block off pools and block off other entrances to other locations. Some people say that this raid happened due to some rumors floating around on 4chan that moderators were abusing their moderation powers to disproportionately ban avatars with a dark skin color. And some people claim that this was a protest against that. Although a lot of the people that participated participated in these raids probably didn't have that on their minds. The phrase pools close became a pretty popular catchphrase amongst people in these raids, and this phrase kind of became a meme that grew beyond just 4chan and Habbo Hotel. Phoenix Jones is a guy who's dedicated a solid portion of his life to being a real-life superhero. His real name's Ben Fedor, and since 2010, he's been roaming the streets of Seattle, Washington, trying to fight crime, protect civilians, and do good deeds. He wears a black and gold colored suit that is supposedly reinforced with bullet and stab-resistant plating. 
also wears a bulletproof vest underneath it. Usually his weapon of choice is his fists or pepper spray, but reportedly at one point he even tried carrying around a net launcher to catch criminals with. Throughout his career, he's actually managed to stop quite a few fights and help a couple people from getting mugged. He's also an MMA fighter, and so a lot of people think he's doing this Phoenix Jones thing as a publicity stunt. In 2020, he was arrested for allegedly selling MDMA, but since then he's seemingly been released and could potentially be roaming the streets of Seattle as we speak. Garfield minus Garfield. Garfield minus Garfield is a website that posts Garfield comics with Garfield removed from them. It turns the Garfield comics into this completely different experience that makes it feel like John is a lonely man battling mental illness and is just alone talking to himself. The Dictionary of Obscure Sorrows. The Dictionary of Obscure Sorrows, most predominantly, is a website dedicated to creating new words to describe specific emotions that don't have a specific word to describe them yet. For example, the word ringlord describes the feeling that goes with the wish that the modern world felt as epic as the one once depicted in old stories and folktales. Probably the most popular word from this being the term sonder, which it defines as the realization that each random passerby is living a life as vivid and complex complex as your own, populated with their own ambitions, friends, routines, worries, and inherited craziness. Wikipedia deleted articles. So this is a Wikipedia page for Wikipedia articles that have been deemed unnecessary or weird or extreme, and when these articles are deleted, they're put on this deleted articles list. Probably my favorite ones on this list are Beware the Green Monkey, Inappropriate Touch Tuesday and more information on this subject is available. I look like BrockObama.com. I look like BrockObama.com is a shit post website about this guy that thinks he looks like Barack Obama. Hi, my name's Trevor and I look like Barack Obama. I've had lots of people stop me on the streets, ask me about taxes and healthcare and things like that. And I thought I'd create a website to clarify that I am in fact, not Barack Obama. I'm not the president of the United States. So please, if you see me on the streets, don't come up to me asking if I'm Barack Obama. I'm not. He has bodyguards and dresses better. I drew all sorts of lines all over the images to make it look like facial recognition stuff. Notice how similar the lines are. It's not just a coincidence. We really look alike. Nowadays, this website's pretty much gone. If you try and visit ilooklikebrockobama.com, you'll just get this page that has the definition of the term microaggression. I guess the guy who made the website decided to take it down because people were viewing it as a microaggression or he started viewing it as a microaggression. Vermin Supreme is a guy who has run for president in every single election cycle since 1992. Some of the policies he campaigns on are legally requiring all Americans to bring brush their teeth, government-funded research into time travel, and providing every American with a free pony to help shift towards a more pony-based economy. He's a comedian and performance artist. He's ran under the Republican Party, the Democratic Party, and in the 2020 presidential election, he actually got third place in the Libertarian presidential primaries. So he's getting closer to being on the ticket. Also, here's a clip of him pouring glitter onto one of his opponents at a debate. Okay, thank you, Mr. Supreme. Who Killed Captain Alex? Who Killed Captain Alex is a Ugandan action film with a budget reportedly lower than $200. Isaac Godfrey Geoffrey Nabwana, or I'm just gonna call him Nabwana, is the man behind this film. And this one guy is pretty much the complete driving force behind the film with him directing, editing, and doing the screenplay for this film. Pretty much all the props and rigging for this film were made using scrap metal. Apparently the computer that was used to edit this film was made from whatever old spare computer parts Nabwana was able to get his hands on. The movie calls itself Uganda's first action film, and it probably is, and the original version of the film has seemingly been completely lost. The only version of this film that still exists has what's called a video joker in it. A video joker is this guy who gets dubbed over the audio in the film and does commentary, and the only version of the film that still exists has a video joker dubbed over it. <laughs> I will kill you all. The movie has garnered a lot of fans from Western audiences over recent years, and it's another example of a film that's so bad it's kind of endearing. Dashcon was a convention that was held in Schamburg, Illinois in 2014, and the idea behind it was that it would be a convention centered around Tumblr and the many different Tumblr fandoms that existed at the time. When the convention actually happened, it was a complete mess, and the whole thing was completely mismanaged. Very few vendors showed up, a bunch of performances that were supposed to be at the convention pulled out because at the last second, the 
convention decided that they weren't going to pay for their hotel rooms. And there only ended up being about 350 attendees, even though they were projecting somewhere between 3,000 and 7,000. Because a lot of the performances pulled out, a lot of the attendees who wanted to see their favorite performers wouldn't be able to. And so reportedly what was happening is the convention organizers were offering people a voucher for an extra hour in the ball pit as compensation. This is what that ball pit looked like. I love bees. I love bees was an ARG that was set up to advertise and build hype for the release of Halo 2. In one of the trailers for Halo 2, at the end of the trailer, the website ilovebees.com would flash onto the screen. And if you were to decide to visit the website, you'd be met by this blog that was supposed to be owned by this beekeeper by the name of Margaret. And throughout the website, there's these weird, glitchy, corrupted effects taking place. And the homepage would have a message that read, Control has been yielded to system peril distributed reflex. Countdown to wide awake and physical. Make your decisions accordingly. Question, what happened to this site? Answer, no idea. Help me out. After digging into the website and looking into a blog associated with the site where Margaret's daughter would express confusion and questions towards what was happening to her mother's website, it would eventually be discovered that the story behind this ARG was that a rogue AI from the Halo universe was seeking refuge from destruction, so it inserted itself into the I Love Bees website in an attempt to preserve itself. And while the AI was being hosted on the I Love Bees website, it would start corrupting the website and it would try and send out messages to the outside world to try and communicate to people what its current situation was. To figure all this stuff out, players in this ARG would be tasked to solve puzzles to progress the story. With one of the most important parts of the ARG tasking players to activate 777 axons to progress the story. And to activate these axons, players would need to visit certain GPS coordinates where payphones would be located. And while at the payphone, payphone would ring at a certain time and players would be required to answer questions and provide the person on the other end with a secret code word that would then activate the axon. After these 777 payphone axons were activated, certain players of this ARG would be invited to a one of four movie theaters throughout the United States where special events would be held where people could get early hands-on time and play Halo 2. 17,776. So in real life on June 7th, the sports blog owned by Vox Media known as SB Nation published this article titled What Football Will Look Like in the Future. And upon clicking on the article and going to the webpage, the text on the page would just start growing until the entire screen turned black. And this is the point where the web page transitions from being a sports blog to this narrative story thing called 17,776. The story is told through a bunch of different web pages and videos and articles, and this is the general idea of how it goes. The story is about three space probes who, after aimlessly floating through space for a lot of time, eventually gained sentience. Just go with it. And after thousands of years of just floating through space aimlessly, they eventually met up with one another in the year 17,776 and decided to observe and talk about Earth. In the year 17,776, humans on Earth have basically become immortal. No one dies, no one reproduces, everyone lives in good health, and war and conflict has ended. And since at this point humans live in this perfect utopian future, they have nothing better to do than play absolutely crazy and convoluted versions of football. So in this future, humans have invented nanotechnology that allows them to be pretty much indestructible and immortal. Mortal. So, the story explains that, for example, there's a game of football that they play that uses the entirety of Nebraska as the playing field. There's a version of the game where a football is launched out of a cannon in Alaska and will land somewhere in the continental United States and the first to touch the ball is awarded points. There's a version of the game that is being played between the Mexican and Canadian border that has been in a deadlock for 13,000 years. The Bibbits. The Bibbits is an artificial life evolution simulator. Within the simulation, there's these creatures called Bibbits, and just like real life life, they're trying to get food to stay alive. At the start, all the Bibbits will be given slightly different versions of genes, making some of them more effective at getting food. The Bibbits can reproduce and pass on their genes to the next generation. So through natural selection, the Bibbits will evolve to become much more effective at getting food, and it can lead the Bibbits to become really complex. The Bibbits are programmed to have brains that can evolve to have really complex behaviors. So as the simulation goes on, you'll start seeing Bibbits sometimes getting aggressive, you'll start seeing them hurting with one another, you'll start seeing them move in weird ways. Cyber ethnography. So ethnography is the study of people groups and their different traditions and moral standards, values, beliefs, social hierarchies, and dialects and stuff like that. So the idea behind cyber 
her ethnography is just like how real life people groups have their own unique cultures and customs and dialects, online people groups do as well. So the idea being, for example, a furry role playing group on Tumblr will probably have a different culture than that of a hate group on 4chan, and they will probably have a different culture than that of a Facebook group for moms. All these online people groups will have their own unique values, traditions, moral standards, and they'll all even have their own unique dialects to some extent. 2222 card Yu-Gi-Oh deck. At the 2007 Yu-Gi-Oh German Nationals, a guy entered the tournament with a 2222 card deck. At the time, the Yu-Gi-Oh rule set didn't have a maximum deck size, so this move was actually technically legal. The whole point of the deck was to waste as much time as possible when going up against your opponent. This deck was also reportedly disproportionately made up of search cards, and in Yu-Gi-Oh, anytime you use a search card, you have to shuffle your entire deck afterwards, and shuffling a 2222 card deck takes up a ton of time. This deck was brought to the tournament by a guy by the name of Mike Sway. The deck was disqualified the second round of the tournament. A judge at the tournament determined that the deck could not be shuffled in a reasonable amount of time, uh, and he requested that he drop out of the tournament, to which Mike Sway complied. Probably at least part of the reason Mike Sway did this was just to make a joke, but also at the same time, it was probably to put on display the flaws that were in the rule set at the time. At the time, there was no limit to how many cards your deck could have, so this was technically completely legal. A year later, Konami did make changes to the rule set, and one of the rules implemented was a 60 card deck limit, making this type of move now impossible. The Michael Jackson Vault. Michael Jackson died in 2009, and he left behind a lot of unreleased demos and music. This unreleased music is often referred to as being in the Michael Jackson vault, which is being controlled by Sony. There's been a lot of unreleased music that's been released since Michael Jackson's death, but according to Sony, there is still a lot of unreleased stuff being still kept in the Michael Jackson vault, but they have no intentions of releasing it yet. At least that's what they say on the Michael Jackson website. Club Penguin Private Servers. Club Penguin was an online multiplayer game that was shut Shut down in March of 2017 by Disney. The player base had shrunk in pretty substantially, and it probably wasn't a very profitable venture anymore. But let me tell you, this didn't stop dedicated Club Penguin players from keeping the community alive. After the shutdown of Club Penguin, many private Club Penguin servers started popping up and being hosted by private individuals who were not officially being supported by Disney. Probably the most popular version of the game that you can play right now is Club Penguin Rewritten. In May of 2020, the BBC reported on this other private unofficial version of the game called Club Penguin Online. They made an article on Club Penguin Online and they were saying that it was not being moderated properly and the game was being populated by a bunch of racists and anti-semitists, groomers and pedophiles. And the game was not suitable for children. And this led to Disney hunting down the developers behind Club Penguin Online and hitting them with a cease and desist and shutting the game down. Libraryofbabel.info Libraryofbabel.info is a website that has every book that has ever existed. Every book that ever Ever will exist, every document ever written, every paper ever written, every song, poem, scripture, and document ever written. This sounds stupid. How does it work? Okay, so the way this works is the website has on demand every single combination of English alphabet characters that could ever exist. As long as it's 3,200 characters long, that is a catch to it. So imagine a book with 3,200 characters in it, and this library has every combination of 3,200 characters that could exist. Sure, most of the books in this library are complete gibberish, but amongst all these books, there can also be anything. You could find the Bible, Harry Potter, Fifty Shades of Grey, anything because the library has access to every combination of letters, as long as it's 3,200 characters long. The library has 10 to the 4,677 books in it. The website also has this component to it where there's a virtual library you can access the books through. So there's 3,260 hexagonal rooms, each with four walls of bookcases, each case having five shells, with each shelf having 32 books. Lucid dreaming. Lucid dreaming is when you are dreaming and you know you are dreaming. A lot of people say that they can take control of their dreams when they're lucid dreaming and like control the things around them and make things happen and, and do whatever they want. The exact mechanism that makes lucid dreaming happen is unknown. There's a lot of different methods people have developed that supposedly can help people achieve lucid dreaming more often. One of the things you can do is what's called a reality.
reality check every once in a while in your day-to-day -day life. Just look around and make sure you're in reality. Make sure you're not dreaming. For example, look down at your fingers and make sure you have five of them. Make sure you're still in reality. If you make a habit out of this type of reality check, there's a chance that while you're dreaming, you might do this reality check and then realize you're dreaming and then start lucid dreaming. Also, some people suggest keeping a dream journal. So like writing down the things you experience in your dream. And another thing that's often suggested to people that want a lucid dream is while you're falling asleep, try and imagine the scenario you want to be in your lucid dream. Dwarf Fortress. Dwarf Fortress is an indie game that has been in development since 2002 and through nearly its entire development it's only had two developers working on it. The game has multiple different game modes you can play but the most popular game mode takes place in a procedurally generated world where you take control of a group of dwarves with the main goal of creating and growing a fortress. The game uses incredibly simple graphics but what makes this game really stand out is how complicated and how many interlocking systems and pieces the game has. Like just the sheer amount of things that can happen and will happen and take place in this game is insane. It's kind of hard to just give you an idea of how complicated and how much stuff goes on in this game. So I'm going to talk about this interview the lead developer did where he's talking about a bug that he recently patched out from Dwarf Fortress. I think this interview does a good job illustrating how complicated and complex things get in this game. Basically what he does in this interview is he explains a glitch that they patched out from Dwarf Fortress. So what was happening is they recently added bartenders to bars in Dwarf Fortress and what would happen is dwarves would come into these bars and the bartender would serve them a drink and since like dwarves are kind of these ill-mannered creatures there's a chance that they would just throw their drink on the ground and their drink would explode on the ground and put alcohol all over the floor. And also at around this time they made an addition to the game to where cats clean themselves like how cats clean themselves in real life. They clean themselves in the way where they're like licking their paws and then like wiping their face. And so what was happening is cats would come into the bar after dwarves had thrown alcohol on the ground and the cats would walk through the alcohol and get it on their paws and then they'd clean themselves and in the act of cleaning themselves they would get alcohol in their mouth and the glitch was was that this wasn't really planned for and so there was a little bit of an oversight so that whenever a cat was licking its paw when it had alcohol on it it would be equivalent to having an entire drink of alcohol and it would make the cats drunk incredibly fast and they'd start suffering from alcohol poisoning and they'd start exhibiting like one of the seven different symptoms that they coded in for alcohol poisoning and then there would also be a chance that they would die. I just think this interview and this whole situation just goes to show how complicated and how much stuff is going on at once in this game. The game has been in development for 19 years now and they say it's not going to be done for another 10. There was a release of this game on Steam somewhat recently but it's not really a true finished version of the game and the developers of the game said the only reason they did this is because they needed money to pay for their medical bills. Dark Side of the Rainbow. This entry is referring to how if you play Pink Floyd's The Dark Side of the Moon album at the same time as The Wizard of Oz, the two will sync up incredibly well for some reason. The energy of the music follows the characters on screen really well, and sometimes even the lyrics of the music match up with what's going on on screen. Some people think it matches up so well that there's no way this could possibly be a coincidence, and so people speculate that Pink Floyd purposely made The Dark Side of the Moon album to fit with The Wizard of Oz. Members of Pink Floyd have been asked about this and asked if they purposely did this or not, which they've always said that it's just a complete coincidence that their album matches up with The Wizard of Oz. Minecraft missing versions. So this is just referring to how some of the early versions of Minecraft were never archived and as of now they're actually missing. So for example, according to the Minecraft wiki, Java Edition Classic 0.0.19a underscore 02 is missing. We're not really missing out on a whole lot on this update apparently. The only thing that was changed during this update was glass changing texture from this to this. Bulwer Lytton Fiction Contest. This is a contest that is held every year by the San Jose State University to see who can write the worst opening to a book. There are thousands of entries to this contest every year and the 2020 winner for the worst opening was Her Dear John Missive Flapped Ambiguously in the Windy Breeze, Hanging Like a Pizza Menu on the Doorknob of My Mind. Best of Craigslist. This is a website that has a list of weird findings on Craigslist. Here's probably one of my favorite findings on this list. Category is general and it's in the Detroit metro area. What it says on this listing is, want to watch a live birth on mushrooms. Hey there, my friend and I are trying to figure out the craziest thing we could do on magic mushrooms and realize that watching a live childbirth would be by far the most incredible mind-blowing experience that we could think of. We're looking for a woman with child who would permit five respectful 27-year-old men to watch her give birth 
while on magic mushrooms. Compensation is negotiable, but for sure at least $100 per person. And the knowledge of knowing that you just blew some people's mind, having a baby come out of you. This offer may not be for everyone. If you know someone who may be interested, please share this offer so that might fulfill our dream of watching a live birth on mushrooms. Some other cool ones I found is idiot needed to beat vanilla dome in Super Mario World. Human sized steel cage. Whoever responds with the best potential use for this cage will get it free of charge. Welded steel, approximately 200 pounds. Two people can easily move it. Not Prawn. Not Prawn is an online puzzle game where you'll solve different riddles and puzzles to progress through different web pages. Some of the riddles are super complex and complicated. Throughout the puzzle, you'll have to mess with URLs and look into the source codes of pages and edit images and discover hidden codes within music and stuff like that just happens on a regular basis within this puzzle. There's 138 documented different levels to this puzzle and it's taken people reportedly months to complete sometimes. Peepee. -pee. This entry is probably referring to this plushie called a peepee. -pee. It's a plushie being sold by this company called Item Label and some of the other plushies they sell are called the Sucklet and the Dinkle. The company has made a lot of TikToks and YouTube videos about their plushies. Uh, plushies? I don't know. With their most popular YouTube video being called Peepee's Theme. It seems to me as an example of a company trying to use viral marketing to promote and sell their products. There's nothing special about these plushies. It's just named a peepee, -pee, so it's kind of funny and you can make jokes about it and you can be like, oh, I bought a peepee -pee online. From what I can tell, there was a pretty brief trend on TikTok where people were making videos about peepees. Although it's kind of hard to tell if these videos were organically made by people actually wanting to make videos about peepees or if it was item label sponsoring them to make videos. Burr to Will. Burr to Will is one of the very few pieces of land on earth that people debate over who doesn't own it. The area is between Egypt and Sudan. In short, what ended up happening was in 1899, the UK was in charge of defining the border between these two countries. So they just kind of drew a line and said that the border was straight and looked like this. But in 1902, another borderline was drawn as a revision that looks like this. And this borderline was supposedly a borderline that would better reflect cultural differences. I apologize in advance for pronunciation. The thing is, is both countries wanted this area known as the Halaib Triangle. And that meant that claiming this area, Bertawil, meant that by extension, you would not get the Halaib Triangle. Since neither of these countries have claimed this area, it's pretty much the only land not claimed by any country in the world, with the only other place being Antarctica. A number of people throughout the years have just come here and laid down flags and claimed it as their own. Obviously, no one is recognizing them as owning it, but no one is also not recognizing them as owning it either. Luther Burbank. Luther Burbank was a botanist. He created over 800 different new types of plants. Through hybridization and artificial selection, he was able to create the plum cot, which is a half plum, half apricot, white blackberries, cactuses without pricks, a cross between tobacco and petunias, and even a type of plum that didn't have a pit in the middle. In fact, the potatoes that pretty much all fries and tater tots are made of come from a variety of potato invented by him, known as the Burbank potato. Lord Buckethead. Lord Buckethead is a character that comes from a 1984 parody of Star Wars called Hyperspace. This movie that it comes from really isn't that popular and the only reason Lord Buckethead really has any prominence is because on multiple occasions people have dressed up as Lord Buckethead and tried running in the general elections for Prime Minister in the UK. Lord Buckethead's been played by quite a few different people throughout the years and in 1987 Lord Buckethead ran against Margaret Thatcher for Prime Minister. He also ran for Prime Minister in 1992 against John Major and even once again in 2017 he ran against Theresa May. He usually campaigns on such policies as turning Berkshire into a spaceport, but sadly he's never won over 0.01% of the vote. Northern Bria. This entry on the iceberg is kind of coming out of left field. As far as I can tell, this entry is referring to a pretty prominent writer in the Harry Potter fan fiction community. This person goes by the name of Northern Bria, and according to this person's fanfiction.net page, he has written over 89 fan fictions for his Harry Potter extended universe. The Tramp Stamps. The Tramp Stamps are an alt rock punk group that are often accused of being industry plants. Much of their presence on social media feels very artificial. It often feels like they're trying way too hard to appeal to Gen Z kids with their alt-punk aesthetic, and this becomes a really big problem, especially in the alternative punk community because those type of people are really quick to call out posers. Basically, the idea is that this group is not made up of three girls who genuinely wanted to come together to make alt-rock punk music. Instead, it was some large music corporation that, like, artificially assembled these girls and 
artificially like devise them in a way to try and appeal to kids in the alt rock punk community. There's a lot of weird suspicious things about them. The very first posts on their Instagram account are really professionally made, which is weird for a first time thing. They've had a link tree from the very get go. They've had a merch store from the very get go. All stuff that a naturally forming band would probably not have. These are really only things you'd have from the get go if you had some sort of backing from some large financial music group. People dug into the backgrounds of the band members in the Tramp Stamps and all of them have a history of already working in the music industry. And also on top of all that, the way they act is really just artificial looking. It always seems like they're trying to use certain buzzwords to appeal to kids, but till this day they still claim that they're not industry plants. Y2K, a postmodern RPG. This is an indie game that had quite a bit of hype surrounding it. It was released in 2019 on the PS4, PC, and Nintendo Switch, and most of the reviews of the game were pretty negative. Some of the dialogue was really bad, and the combat system was really slow, and the main character was not really liked by many people. And this game has a scene in it that is based off the death of Alyssa Lamb. Alyssa Lamb is a college student who went missing in 2013, and the last known footage of her comes from security camera footage of her standing in an elevator. In the video, she seems very on edge. She seems kind of irritated. She makes kind of unusual gestures as though she's trying to communicate to someone or something. This is the last known appearance of her until two weeks later where her body was found in a water tank on top of the hotel she was staying in. This case, till this day, has remained unsolved. And when asked if this scene is actually a reference to Alyssa Lamb, the developer of the game said, I was someone who was very moved by the terrible case of Alyssa Lamb. I really feel for her tragic passing. Her suffering was influential in the development in the game. People were dogging on the game, and the developer of the game started getting really defensive and arguing that people just didn't understand his art. And it made it a really easy situation to make fun of. Uwu language. So as far as I can tell, this is referring to a pretty popular post on the r slash conlang subreddit. Some person designed a language that surrounds the uwu thing. It's a full-fledged functioning language and technically it would work. The language is completely made up of different o's and woes and uwus and stuff like that. The language has different tenses, moods, pronouns. There's actually a dictionary that's pretty fleshed out with a lot of different vocabulary. So the Westboro Baptist Church is a group in Westboro, Massachusetts that is most often seen as an extremist hate group. The church, although it's not really a church, has a history of abuse among its members. They spread a lot of anti-Semitism and conspiracy theories. They're also homophobic to the absolute extreme. They call themselves the Westboro Baptist Church, but they've been denounced by the Baptist World Alliance and Southern Baptist Convention, so they're not really recognized by anyone as true Baptists. Their extreme homophobia has brought a lot of press and infamy, and right next door, there is this house, the Rainbow House. <laughs> This house was purchased and painted rainbow colors in 2013, and it's been there ever since. The buyer of the house said he did it as a way to combat the hate from the church, and nowadays it's a uh, equal marriage rights museum. Biohacking. So the term biohacking is going to be a little bit hard to cover because it can refer to a lot of different things. The term biohacking usually means to manipulate your body in specific ways to make it perform at its maximum potential by using certain medications or certain practices. This can mean a lot of things though. Like for example, getting Getting good sleep and diet and exercise are sometimes referred to as biohacks, which is kind of ridiculous because these are just general healthy lifestyle practices. I think when the term biohacking is used to refer to these kind of things, it's almost an attempt to try and use a buzzword to try to sell the idea of being healthy. There's also like a set of practices that are often referred to as biohacks. Like practices such as young blood transfusions and fecal transplants are often referred to as biohacks. A young blood transfusion is where you take the blood from a young person and inject it into an older person in the hopes of it slowing aging. There's not really evidence to suggest that this is an effective treatment. And a fecal transplant is where you take fecal matter from one person's gut and put it into another person's gut in the hopes of it bolstering their gut bacteria. And there is evidence to suggest that this procedure is effective. Or there's this practice called dopamine fasting that's also often referred to as a biohack. The way dopamine fasting is usually explained is dopamine is the neurotransmitter in your brain that makes you feel happiness. And so if you take a break from doing things that make you happy for a couple days, the idea is that you'll lower your brain's tolerance to dopamine. And so when you go back to doing things that make you happy again, since you've lowered your brain's tolerance to dopamine, everything will make you feel just even happier. There's really no evidence to suggest that this really works though. Biohacking is kind of a complicated entry on this iceberg because biohacking can potentially refer to a lot of different things that are kind of similar or are related to each other in some ways. 
Siva Gunner. Siva Gunner is a YouTube channel that, at first glance, just uploads soundtracks to video games. But with every upload, every song has something changed about it, or it has some sort of gimmick going towards it. The song might have the melody changed, or might be remixed or mashed up with another song. The main idea of this channel, though, is that the titles and thumbnails of each upload would lead you to believe that each upload is just some regular video game soundtrack. But once you click on the video and listen to the song, something about the song has been edited. It's been remixed, or it's been mashed up with some other song or some meme has been integrated into it. What makes this channel work even better is there's a sister channel called Gilva Sunner that just uploads completely legitimate video game soundtracks with no gimmicks. So it makes this situation even more confusing because people that don't understand the joke get confused between Siva Gunner and Gilva Sunner. My Immortal. My Immortal is a fan fiction that is sometimes talked about as the worst fan fiction of all time. It's this Harry Potter fan fiction where a goth girl by the name of Raven goes to Hogwarts and in this alternate reality there's basically two two cliques of kids at Hogwarts, those cliques being goths and prep kids. The goth kids have a rivalry with the prep kids at Hogwarts, and the main character Raven is a love interest of Draco Malfoy. The grammar is awful and the spelling is bad, and the writing tries really hard to have a quirky sense of humor. It's so bad that a lot of people speculate that it's satire. No one has ever been able to track down the original author of this fanfiction, and the original version of the story has actually been deleted from fanfiction.net, so only copy and pasted versions of this original story exist, and some people think that parts of the story that exist right now have actually been modified from the original version. Some people think the last two chapters in the current versions that exist were not actually part of the original story, and also certain segments of the story at the start aren't real. Probably my favorite quote from the book comes from Vorta Mortal in chapter 9. Then all of a sudden, an horrible man with red eyes and no nose and everything started flying towards me on a broomstick. He didn't have a nose, basically like Voldemort in the movie. And he was wearing all black, but it was obvious he wasn't gothic. Martin Cabello. Martin Cabello is his online personality who's pretty popular on TikTok and Instagram. He looks like a pretty unassuming guy, but whenever he talks, it's just crazy, sometimes barely coherent ramblings. Hebrews. Hebrews what? The key tones needed to heal your bones. Cat tones. You think about this simple fact of reality, no matter what religion you believe in, they all tell you they can prove their God's existence and disprove the existence of every other religion's God. Talking about a ton of weird stuff. He often makes references to how the military was trying to hurt his family. Pretty common for him to talk about how quantum physics have some sort of mystic healing powers to them. He's talked about how his brother blew himself up with a gas can. And also he's really into fitness and cryptography for some reason. No one is really sure exactly what this guy's deal is, but based on the way he talks talks about having meltdowns. A lot of people speculate that he has autism or schizophrenia. He has a wife and he seemingly lives on his own, but his videos are just batshit crazy. And he'll seem completely normal one second and then insane the next. Of course, a lot of people think it's an act, which is very possible, but also his consistency in how he acts leads a lot of people to believe that he is genuine. He's refused to do any interviews, so until then, we likely won't have a better idea of what's going on with him. The Room. The Room is probably one of the most infamous examples of a movie that is so bad it's good. Probably the most interesting aspect of this movie is its writer and director Tommy Wiseau and just how little is known about the guy. No one has really been able to pinpoint exactly where he came from, where he was born, how he got to the US. Reportedly, The Room had a six million dollar budget, but no one knows where Tommy Wiseau got this six million dollars from. One theory suggests that he's receiving money from some crime ring in Europe. Another theory suggests that he was hit by a car that was being driven by some celebrity in LA, and the celebrity decided to pay Tommy Wiseau a huge sum of money so that he would keep quiet about the situation, and that's just where he got his money from. Some people also think that the movie didn't really cost six million dollars. The large budget was actually just part of some money laundering scheme that he was involved in. Tommy Wiseau, till this day, is still very quiet about his background and how he received the money to produce this film, and refuses to answer a lot of the questions Posed to him, so until he opens up, there's still gonna be a lot of mystery surrounding his background. Grape Coon. Grape Coon is a penguin that got obsessed with a cardboard cutout of an anime girl. So there was a zoo in Japan that was doing a collaboration with this anime called Kimono Friends, and for this collaboration, they put a bunch of different cardboard cutouts of anime girls from the show in some of the different animal exhibits, and they put one of them in the penguin exhibit, and this penguin that went by the name of Grape Coon got obsessed with it. He was even trying to court with the anime cutout. A bunch of different 
different news outlets picked up on this situation. People were making fan art about it. Even the voice actor of this character from the anime came and met up with the penguin. It's a pretty nice story. When Grape Coon died, they made a memorial for Grape Coon, and this memorial displayed his affection for the cardboard cutout. Pure Flix is an evangelical Christian film production company that has a streaming service of the same name. All the films on this streaming service are aimed at evangelical Christians and are meant for an evangelical Christian audience. And all of them are pretty low quality and overall pretty bad. The founder of the company, David White, writes, produces, and stars in over 50 of the movies on the platform. Much of the time, he plays the male, heartthrob character who saves the day and turns everyone Christian at the end of the story, even though overall he's not a very good actor. And a lot of the time, it doesn't seem like he's acting in these movies because of his love for God or his faith, but more so because he just likes being in the limelight and being the hero and being the main character and making money. Most of the movies on this platform are really shallow too and have just bad writing and storytelling. The service has a bunch of movies that are essentially clean Christian versions of other movies and it makes the platform really easy to poke fun at. Piss Jar Sands. So this band called Piss Jar made a typeface that was created by peeing on a bed sheet and then taking a picture of it. I want to show it to you guys but I don't think I can. Someone literally peed out the shape of a letter and then took a picture of it. Apparently peeing out letters on a bed is a pretty challenging task, so it took over 300 peeing sessions to complete the typeface. Tencent. Tencent is one of the biggest Chinese tech companies, and it has a bunch of connections with other prominent tech companies. Tencent has stakes in Epic Games, Roblox, Snapchat, Discord, Reddit, a ton of other different companies too. Probably the most notable aspect of Tencent is their app, WeChat. With this app becoming a huge staple of everyday life in China, almost becoming a necessity. People text on WeChat, call on WeChat, book flights, get reservations at restaurants, watch movies, and play games. Since WeChat operates out of China and under Chinese law, Tencent is legally required to provide any information from WeChat with Chinese intelligence if they request it. This means the Chinese government has access to your text messages, app history, or even your GPS location. This has led uh, Tencent and WeChat to basically become a tool used by the Chinese government to conduct mass surveillance and to some extent even kind of just control its population. Tencent also uses a number of different algorithms to censor anything the Chinese Communist Party doesn't want you to see from WeChat. On WeChat, you're not gonna see people talking about Tiananmen Square or Taiwan or revolution. Russian interference in social media. This entry is probably referring to how within the last decade, Russia has made growing efforts to manipulate and interfere with other countries by spreading false information on social media. Probably with the most prominent and effective example of this taking place within the United States during the 2016 presidential election. According to the United States Department of Justice, the Russian interference on social media was all part of an operation by the Russian government known as Project Lotka, which saw a bunch of Russian government-backed troll farms use social media to spread disinformation on social media within the United States, with the main goal of this operation being to disrupt the democratic process and create as much political chaos as possible. Self-retweeting tweet. So there's this alternate version of Twitter you can use called TweetDeck. It allows you to see more stuff at once, and it's kind of supposed to be a Twitter for more professional users. Well, in 2014, an exploit was found where if a tweet ended in a heart, TweetDeck would read the tweet as though it was a script that it would need to run, and this led to a Twitter account by the name of Durgun making a tweet that took advantage of this exploit that made it so when this tweet appeared in your feed, it would automatically run a script that would make TweetDeck instantly retweet it. This led to the tweet at one point reaching over 80,000 retweets, and Twitter had to shut down TweetDeck for a period of time to fix this exploit. Rotten.com. Rotten.com is one of the earlier shock websites. The website was started in 1996, and it received updates until 2012, and it didn't go offline until sometime in 2018. Most of the content on this website was submitted by users and would be reviewed by an administrator before being posted. Pretty much all the images on the website were also accompanied by some color commentary by the developers of the website. When browsing the website, there are no thumbnails on the content you're looking for. So when you click on something to view it, you only have a short line of text to give you any idea of what you're getting yourself into. Much of the time, this text is very misleading. Over the years, the website also went through a couple different controversies, with probably the most prominent one being where when the website was allegedly hosting pictures of Princess Diane's body being recovered after the car crash, she was in, with the rumor saying that this picture was recovered from some medical records. The whole thing turned out to be fake, but it brought a spike in attention to the website. The website also had a section called Rotten.com Deadpool, where you could play a game where people would predict what famous people would die within the next 12 months, and people who made accurate predictions would be awarded points and rank up. The website even had a section where you could buy merchandise that was Rotten.com themed. DolphinSex.org DolphinSex.org is a website where a guy outlines how to do it with a dolphin. He goes into great detail Detail. And whoever is writing it never really explains if they've actually done it themselves or if they're just explaining.
explaining it. There's not a lot of information surrounding this website. It's probably satire. It's probably fake. You'd probably hope it is otherkin. And otherkin is someone who identifies as being not entirely human. For example, an otherkin might identify as being half human, half wolf, or half human, half dragon, or half human, half fox, half human, half anything else. And it's not the same thing as being a furry where people just dress up as other characters. The whole point of being an otherkin is that you genuinely believe that you are partially human part something else. The most mysterious song on the internet. In March of 2017, a user on this website called Spirit Radio posted a snippet of this song asking people if they could identify it. It was just a short snippet and the person who posted it claimed that they recorded it sometime between 1982 and 1984 off of a German radio station and they had been looking for info about the song ever since. Since then, people have been able to identify what radio station it was being played on and even full versions of the song have been recovered, but still no one knows what band was behind it, when it was recorded, where it was recorded, stuff like that. So there's still a lot of mystery surrounding it. So this is one of those things that you just can't really talk about on YouTube right now. This entry is a pretty prominent conspiracy theory. It's not very obscure. If you want to figure out what it is, it really is just a Google search away. But due to a lot of the things surrounding it, you just can't really talk about it on YouTube right now. I don't want to risk this video getting flagged, so we're gonna move on. Hong Kong 97. Hong Kong 97 is a game that for a long time was shrouded in quite a bit of mystery. History. The game takes place in China during the handover of Hong Kong from the United Kingdom back to China. And in the game, you play as a close relative of Bruce Lee, and you've been tasked by the Hong Kong government to kill the entire population of China. And you also have to combat a resurrected zombie version of Deng Xiaoping. The game is ridiculously hard, it's pretty much broken, and it's gained a cool following. Also, the death screen of the game has a picture of an actual dead body, and for a long time, people couldn't identify where this picture was from until people eventually discovered that it's actually a picture of a war victim from the Bosnian War. The game had a bootleg release in Japan in 1995. The game was originally made for the Super Nintendo, but it was never officially licensed by Nintendo. So upon its initial release, it only reportedly sold like 30 copies on bootleg cartridges. For a long time, the lead developer of this game, Yoshihisa Kurosawa, never answered questions about this game or never wanted to do interviews about this game because, you know, people had a lot of questions about it. Until eventually, he just came out and said that the whole point of the game was to make the worst game possible as kind of a way to make fun of the gaming industry. Catastrophe Crow. Catastrophe Crow is a ARG about a lost N64 game. Basically the story behind it is that during the 90s a lot of money and time was being dedicated towards the development of a game called Catastrophe Crow but after budget cuts and people leaving development, development of the game was cancelled but eventually later on a development unfinished version of the game was leaked to the public and when you play the game there's a bunch of weird mysterious creepy stuff that happened. Happened. A lot of the weird events in the game seemingly being related to the death of one of the lead developer's daughters, Justin Bieber Linux. This entry is referring to Justin Bieber Linux, I think, which is a Linux-based operating system that is Justin Bieber themed. Kali Linux. Kali Linux is an operating system that is also Linux-based. Kali Linux is an operating system that is built around hacking into computer programs and looking for security vulnerabilities in computer programs. The operating system comes with a bunch of tools pre-installed that let you test how secure a computer program is. See how much stress a computer program can handle. Look for exploits in a computer program that will allow you to easily hack into it. Stuff like that. And the thing is about this computer program is it has so many tools that are like this that it is sometimes used by actual hackers who are trying to hack into things illegally. Deleted JonTron videos. JonTron is a YouTuber with a pretty strong fan base and although these fans have done a pretty good job archiving all of JonTron's videos, till this day it seems as though there's still some videos that have just been deleted off the internet and never will be found. The background rooms and liminal space. So the term liminal space refers to an area that is a transition area between two different locations or states of being. And within recent times, pictures of liminal spaces have become a pretty popular thing as a lot of the time they can give off a pretty unsettling or eerie vibe. But nowadays, the term liminal space is kind of just used to describe any picture that gives off that certain eerie unsettling vibe that comes from pictures that seem somewhat familiar but you can't quite place your finger on it. The back rooms is probably one of the most popular examples of a liminal space picture. This picture is of some old defunct 
office space that looks very familiar and it totally feels like you've been there before, but something about it just feels kind of off and unsettling. Wikipedia, unusual articles. This is a Wikipedia page that lists a bunch of other Wikipedia pages that are unusual. Some of my personal favorite pages are Kentucky Meat Shower, Coffee Enema, Trout Tickling, Worm Charming, Frog Battery, and How Now Brown Cow, Kiwi Farms. Kiwi Farms is an online forum or website that is dedicated to targeting and bullying certain individuals. The website was originally called the Quickie Forums, the CWCKI Forums, and it was almost entirely dedicated to just harassing Christian Western Chandler. Within recent years, the website has rebranded to Kiwi Farms and has moved on to target other people beyond Christian Western Chandler. Nazbol. This is an ideology that combines both national Bolshevikism with Nazism. A lot of people considered it a joke, but nowadays, in some cases, it isn't. Bug bounties. A bug bounty is basically when a tech company will pay you money to find a bug or exploit in their software for their company. Google actually has a page with a chart on it that will show you how much they will pay you if you find certain types of bugs in their software. For example, this graph by Google says that if you find a bug that allows you to do remote code execution in an application that permits taking over a Google account, you could be awarded over $31,000. Phineas Gage. In 1848, an American railroad construction worker by the name of Phineas Gage was involved in an accident while working on the railroad. Phineas Gage was working in a group of men who were blasting rock to prepare the roadbed to have railroad tracks put down. Setting a blast at the time meant boring a hole into the ground, pouring blasting powder into the hole, and then patting down dirt or clay with a metal rod on top of the blasting powder. While working, Phineas got distracted one time and looked away while he was patting down the blasting powder, and the blasting powder ignited, exploded, shot the metal rod up out of the hole and through the left side of the frontal lobe of his brain. The thing is, is he survived the injury even though he literally had a giant metal rod driven through his head. In fact, some reports say that after the rod hit him, he fell to the ground, had some brief convulsions, and then was just able to stand up, talk, and even walk away. After his injury, the early stages of his recovery were pretty bad, with reports by his doctors saying that he had some speech problems, and even went semi-comatose for a period of time. But eventually, he was able to regain control over himself almost completely. Phineas Gage's memory was pretty much unaffected by the accident, and his intelligence wasn't really affected by the accident either, but reportedly his personality had changed largely after the accident. Prior to the accident, he was often described as hardworking and responsible and mild-mannered, but after the accident, his personality was often described as being the exact opposite of what it once was. He became really disrespectful, he had complete lack of forethought, he was never embarrassed, he was incredibly vulgar, he had no respect for social norms, and reports by his friends and acquaintances said that he no longer had the same personality and seemed like a completely different person. This case for a long time played a large role in the idea that the brain's role in personality is huge, and that specific parts of the brain carry out specific tasks and damaging specific areas can have specific mental effects. In more recent years though, Phineas Gage has become more of a medical folklore rather than an actual medical study, as many people now believe that Phineas Gage's personality changes were exaggerated and misrepresented by reports. In fact, in Phineas's later years, he moved to Chile and became a stage coach where he reportedly regained a lot of his social skills, his personality kind of went back to normal and made a very remarkable recovery. Maps and no maps. A map is someone who is a minor attracted person. Most people say that the term originates from Tumblr and it was an attempt for pedophiles to try and insert themselves into the LGBTQ community. The idea kind of being that the LGBTQ community is all about being accepting of different sexualities. So be accepting of my sexuality. I'm attracted to kids. The prominence of the map community is really overblown. There's not a lot of people out there that are actually identifying as maps, but it's kind of a good thing in general that as a society we're just not very tolerant about stuff like this. It was a really popular topic for commentary YouTubers to cover for a while since it's a topic that's so easy to make fun of. Infowars. Infowars is a far right-wing news website. The website regularly pushes conspiracy theories, stuff about the New World Order, chemtrails, weather control, poison in your tap water, that type of stuff. And probably the focal point of this website is the talk radio show hosted on it called Infowars, hosted by none other than the living meme Alex Alex Jones. We're not gonna have Pepsi with baby flavoring in it! I mean, what the hell have we become? Excuse me! The show used to be hosted on a bunch of other platforms like Spotify and YouTube, but it's since been pulled from those platforms and really the only place you can watch it now is on the InfoWars website. Alex Jones doesn't make any money off of the ad revenue from the show or the website, so he's always advertising for some male vitality dietary supplement. It's gonna boost your testosterone and improve cognitive function, and it's always being sold at a really steep price. Marathon speedrunning. Marathon speedrunning is where instead of just speedrunning through one game, you speedrun through multiple games in one sitting. 
Battle for Bikini Bottom speedrunning. So SpongeBob Battle for Bikini Bottom is a SpongeBob game released for the PS2, Xbox, and GameCube in 2003. Upon its initial release, it was fairly well received, but it didn't have a lot of staying power. But within recent years, the community for this game has been growing because speedrunning it has become pretty popular. The speedrunning scene for this game is very competitive. There's so many complicated and convoluted glitches and exploits that can be used to shave off time from your speedrun. Watching a Battle for Bikini Bottom speedrun, it's oftentimes hard to tell what's even going on. In fact, the community is so dedicated that they discovered that if you smudge the game disc in very specific spots, it'll make certain glitches easier to perform. This technique is banned from actual speedruns, but it goes to show how dedicated some people in this community are. Video game anti-piracy screen. A lot of video games have measures implemented into them to prevent piracy. For example, some older games have something called an anti-piracy screen. Basically, the way an anti-piracy screen is supposed to work is if the game detects that it's being run on hardware that it's not supposed to be run on, or it detects that the game has been illegally downloaded or illegally copied, it will lock itself on a certain screen and just make itself unplayable. And if this technique works properly, it can prevent piracy because pirated copies of the game are unplayable. In recent years, it's kind of become a meme to make mock-up anti-piracy screens for games that don't actually have them. And a lot of the time, these mock-up anti-piracy screens are supposed to kind of have an element of horror to them. Shrek Retold. So Shrek Retold is a movie you can watch on YouTube where basically this group called 3GI Industries enlisted 200 different people to remake Shrek. So one person remade the first five seconds of Shrek and then another person remade the second five seconds of Shrek and then another person made like the third five seconds of Shrek and it's like that the entire movie. So throughout the movie, the art style keeps changing and the voice actors keep changing and the music keeps changing. Due to the fact that the voice actors keep changing and the art style keeps shifting, it can be kind of hard to follow at times. But if you've already seen Shrek before, for. You can kind of maintain an idea of what's going on. A lot of weird people also got involved in the making of this. Chris Chan, Anthony Fantano, Siva Gunner, that guy that made those Spongebob anime opening videos, Darknet Market. Since the Darknet can provide anonymity to pretty much anyone who uses it, there's been quite a few markets and stores set up on the Darknet that sell a number of illegal things that you'd never be able to find on the Clearnet. It's not uncommon for Darknet markets to sell things such as illegal firearms, drugs, counterfeit passports, counterfeit money, and a number of other illegal things and services. And also due to the illegal underground nature of a darknet market, it's not uncommon for them to just be a scam to scam money out of you, or they might even be a honeypot trying to catch you trying to do illegal shit. YouTube in the last hour. This is kind of a weird entry on the iceberg. What I suspect this is referring to is if you search up a term on YouTube and filter by uploaded in the last hour, you can find some really weird results. PetiteTube.com. So this website has a very misleading sounding name. This is basically just a website that shows you YouTube videos videos with very low view counts. The website selects videos with never more than like 30 views and just shows them to you. And using this website, you'll sometimes find some really random and obscure stuff. Sam Hyde. So Sam Hyde is kind of a comedian. He's in a comedy group called Million Dollar Extreme that had a show on Adult Swim briefly, but it was canceled pretty quickly because the show had some material in it that was pretty controversial and people started taking notice of Sam Hyde's affiliation with the alt-right. What he's probably most prominently known for right now is, I'm gonna have to watch my words when I'm talking about this. Whenever there's an event in which multiple people die to an active gunman, it's kind of become a meme to falsely report Sam Hyde as the perpetrator. 10 to the C. So in 2011, Notch, the creator of Minecraft, decided to step down as the lead developer of Minecraft and work on a new project. This project was a game called 10 to the C and it never was completed. A lot of footage of the game exists and it was kind of like this sandbox space science fiction game. The game was said to have a pretty big scope with a game supposed to be including engineering, space battles. You'd be able to land on planets and mine for resources. It'd be a single player mode and a multiplayer mode. The game seemed pretty promising, but development of it was pretty much suspended in 2013 because at the time, popularity in Minecraft really started growing and he decided it would probably be better to dedicate Mojang's time and resources to Minecraft instead of this new game. Notch has effectively gone on record saying that the game has been cancelled. Style Transfer AI. So Style Transfer AI is probably referring to a computer vision technique where you take one picture and by using a computer algorithm you can implement the style of that picture onto another picture. At this point there's a couple different computer algorithms that can do this type of thing. These types of computer algorithms make use of a neural network. Um, 
Um, I'm not gonna say this. I can't say this. This is YouTube. I can't say this. What this is, is a now defunct TF2 server that was basically complete anarchy. There were no rules you could hack. You could do whatever you want. You could talk about whatever you want. When asked about why the server was named what it is, the owner said, it is not affiliated with the alt-right, alt-wrong, or any other political perspectives. It exists only to shit talk and to play the game in an unrestricted space. CES letter. So the story goes that a man by the name of Jeremy T. Runnels was a seventh generation member of the Mormon Church, Church of Latter-day Saints. He served on a mission to the church. He went to the Brigham Young University, which is a college owned by the Church of Latter-day Saints. He was pretty much a full-fledged Mormon. Apparently in 2012, he started doubting the Mormon Church and his faith started waning. This led him into contact with the church education system's director, where he was suggested to write a letter outlining his concerns about the church. And this is what the CES letter is. This letter outlines a bunch of different historical inaccuracies within the lore of the church, the church's history of polygamy and polyandry, and a bunch of other problems with the church. And after a year of not getting a response from the church education system's director after sending the letter, Jeremy Runnels decided to post the letter online and title it the CES letter. This document has gained quite a bit of notoriety, as many people who are leaving the Mormon church point towards the CES letter as being one of their biggest influences. Reality shifters. Reality shifters are people who believe that they can transport their consciousness from their current reality to whatever reality they want to. Many reality shifters claim that they can reality shift to wherever they want to, their favorite anime or whatever. Some people think that reality shifters are taking part in some form of lucid dreaming, while others believe that reality shifters are literally shifting their consciousness to another reality. Of course, there's little scientific evidence to directly back up reality shifting, but a lot of people like to point to a report by the CIA that was made in 1983 about something called the Gateway Experience. This document called Analysis and Assessment of the Gateway Process is really dense and is kind of a mix of science and pseudoscience. There's so much stuff covered in this document, but the main idea is that if you're able to get the brainwaves in the left hemisphere and right hemisphere to synchronize with one another, it can lead to an altered state of consciousness that is free from physical reality and your consciousness can escape the restrictions of time and space. This is referred to as the gateway experience, and it can be achieved through meditation while listening to certain audio tracks, these audio tracks being called the gateway tapes. A lot of reality shifters will point towards this document as being evidence that reality shifting is real. This document is very odd, and it's kind of hard to know what to take away from it. It's kind of surprising you don't see more people talk about this. This is one of those things that I'm thinking might need a video of its own. AMC TV Breaking Bad Extras. As far as I can tell, this is just referring to extras from Breaking Bad, clips that were taken during film and production, bloopers, stuff like that. You can find them on YouTube. I can't tell if I'm missing something here. Nothing about this really seems to be a rabbit hole. The Sandlerverse. This is an idea that all the Adam Sandler movies are connected within the same universe, or they take place within the same universe. Throughout a bunch of Adam Sandler movies, there's weird connections you can find. For example, in the Adam Sandler movie, 50 First Dates, there's this character named 10 Second Tom, and his joke is that he has a 10 second memory. And this character also shows up in the movie Blended. So there's a connection there. Also in Happy Gilmore, more Chubbs Peterson falls to his death, but later in the movie Little Nicky, he is in heaven, so there's a connection there. It's really convoluted, you gotta suspend your disbelief, but it's kinda there. Digital Homicide Studios. Digital Homicide Studios is a video game developer that has a pretty bad reputation for asset flipping or making games that would be considered asset flips. Much of the content in a Digital Homicide Studios game is not content that they actually made. Instead, much of the time, the character models or the music or sometimes even the gameplay mechanics were made by some other other third-party company, and Digital Homicide Studios just buys these things and then kind of glues them together into what they call a game, and then they sell that. And most of the time, this practice results in a game that is not good. The company also has a reputation for suing anyone who criticizes their games, with the company suing a game reviewer by the name of Jim Sterling after he poorly reviewed one of their games. And of course, due to the poor quality of these games, Steam users were leaving a lot of negative reviews of these games, and Digital Homicide Studios made an attempt to sue these people for leaving negative negative reviews. They ended up trying to sue around a hundred Steam users who were just leaving negative reviews. Fortunately, none of the lawsuits against the Steam users or Jim Sterling ever went through. I am God. This is referring to an old 4chan thread about a guy who has a computer that has a virus on it that claims to be God. This whole thing started when someone made a post on 4chan's paranormal board. Hi X, I used to browse here a lot a few years back, but I haven't stopped in for some time. A friend of mine recently had to send his computer into the shop because he thought he had downloaded some kind of virus. At the same time, he kept telling me about weird stuff that keeps happening to him in his house. The main one is he's been having issues with both lights and his television turning either on or off when he knows that he left them the other way before leaving the 
room and returning. He hasn't actually witnessed them going out, but they're always opposite of how he left them. From what I heard, the only real thing that he noticed being up with his computer is that he kept finding image and text files in his downloaded folder that he had never knowingly downloaded. Long story short, this got me thinking, do you think it could ever be possible for some sort of paranormal entity to either fuck with your computer or maybe even could the computer be the original source of whatever is fucking up his house? Then eventually the original poster of this starts posting pieces of an image that he says he found on this computer. They've just been mysteriously appearing on it and people start piecing together these images and it makes this face and there's also an encoded message that goes with it that says I am God. It's a pretty popular ARG and it got a lot of different message boards on 4chan involved. Tails Gets Trolled. Tails Gets Trolled is a webcomic that's garnered a pretty strong following. You might actually be familiar with a couple stills from this webcomic. A couple panels from this webcomic have become memes as reaction images. The premise of the comic is that Tails gets trolled, and it starts a conflict between Tails and these trolls, and throughout the entire webcomic, this conflict continues to escalate and get more complicated as more characters get introduced and new motives get introduced. And at this point in the comic, there are so many different characters with differing motives. It's completely completely ridiculous. The vast majority of the characters in this comic were pulled from some licensed property. Like they're all cartoon or video game characters and everything is drawn in this art style. And like most of the panels in this comic book are just shot reverse shot of characters faces. And at points there are just huge walls of text. A lot of people compare this webcomic to Sonichu and in some ways it is similar, but it also kind of differs in its overall feel. It's kind of a hard thing to quickly explain, but to explain how Sonichu and Tails gets trolled differ. I think the easiest way to put it is that the Sonichu webcomic is a genuine attempt at making a serious webcomic. The Sonichu webcomic tries to take itself seriously, but with Tails Gets Trolled, although there are elements of it that try to take itself seriously, there are very prominent elements of this webcomic that display self-awareness, and the comic does make fun of itself from time to time. Gypsy Crusader. Paul Miller was a guy who did independent journalism for quite a while, but as the story goes, after he had a pretty bad experience with Antifa, he started becoming more and more right-leaning. Eventually, to the point where he kind of became a figure within the alt-right community. He gained a lot of popularity by dressing up as certain characters like the Joker and live streaming himself going on Omegle and other websites and expressing his alt-right sentiments. And at around this time, Paul Miller started adopting the name Gypsy Crusader. In 2020, the Anti-Defamation League reported him to law enforcement. Gypsy Crusader was already on the US government's radar because in kind of an unrelated situation, in 2006, he was charged with aggravated assault, making it illegal for him to possess a firearm moving forward. But in 2018, he was found to be in possession of a firearm, but he was never directly indicted for it. And so in 2020, when the Anti-Defamation League reported him to the FBI, they were able to raid his house in 2021 on terms of him illegally possessing a firearm. And then following this, he was also arrested. Our slash Pyongyang is a subreddit where the owners pretend to be members of the North Korean government. They post a bunch of North Korean propaganda and try and act like this is just a North Korean subreddit. Meat Canyon. Meat Canyon is a YouTube channel that makes disturbing disturbing parodies of cartoons. This isn't a rabbit hole, this is just a YouTube channel that exists. This is another one of the entries that I find is kind of confusing because it's not something that I think should really be considered a rabbit hole, unless I'm missing something here. Viper. This is referring to a rapper who goes by the name of Viper. He's based in Houston and he's released over 1,500 albums. Most people consider his style to be cloud rap, which is rap that kind of has a vaporwave or ethereal feel to it. He's released over 1,500 albums throughout his career, with most of them being pretty low quality and a large number of them being remixed or edited versions of other songs from other albums. He's been making rap music since the early 2000s, but his first album to really gain traction is his fifth album, Yule Cowards Don't Even Smoke Crack with this album and its cover kind of becoming a meme. His music is usually considered to be an example of outsider music, and he's usually considered to be an outsider artist. The term outsider music is used to describe music that is created by self-taught, inexperienced musicians that don't really have an understanding of the culture surrounding the music they're trying to make, and it makes it sound very disconnected and it doesn't fit within a lot of the music norms that we come to expect. Vending machine deaths. Vending machine death statistics will probably surprise you. Most vending machine deaths involve someone trying to shake the vending machine, trying to get some sort of snack out of it, but then actually accidentally tipping it over onto themselves. A report by the U.S. Consumer Product Safety Commission from 1995 says that at least 37 deaths and 113 injuries in the United States between 1978 and 1995 were a result of consumers rocking or tilting vending machines in an attempt to obtain free soda or money. That's coming out to be around 2.18 deaths per year. So sure, this information is a little bit outdated, but the fact that that many people died from vending machines between 1978 and 1995 
vibe is pretty ridiculous. Vor, which is short for vorophilia, is a fetish that revolves around eating other people or being eaten by other people. Also, not necessarily people, it can be any type of creature really. The fantasy usually involves a victim being swallowed whole through the mouth, but there's other ways this fantasy can be played out as well. Vor can happen between humans, animals, furry-like creatures, Pokemon, you name it, and someone probably is into that kind of ore. I've looked into this to try and get a better idea of what the appeal of it is, and this is an explanation that I found on Reddit that kind of articulates it a little bit maybe. So this is what someone said in response to why he likes Vore. This answer is going to require a bit of background information. In the Vore community, there's a bit of a divide between people who prefer the creature being eaten, prey, being digested, and others who prefer to see the prey be spat out unharmed. I personally fall into the latter category. Yeah, I know it's physically impossible, but whatever. Scientific accuracy is for dinosaurs. The thing about Vore that appeals to me is the closeness and intimacy between the two parties involved. I mean, it's literally letting someone inside you. In a weird and abstract way, it's really cute. Think of it like cuddling taken to the extreme. For reasons I'd prefer not to get into, I was a really lonely kid, so the idea of this kind of intense intimacy really appeals to me. It's bizarre, I know, but that's human psychology for you. I'm probably explaining this terribly, TBH. The Blue Whale Challenge. Okay, so the Blue Whale Challenge doesn't have a perfectly defined set of rules, but the general idea of it is that someone will contact you on social media and will start giving you daily tasks to complete that progressively get more dangerous over the course of a month or so. Early stages of the challenge might involve watching horror movies or self-isolating yourself or going on a walk at night. Middle stages might involve self-harm or other ritualistic stuff that can be kind of demonic and dangerous, with the final steps most of the time asking you to take your own life. Where exactly this game originates from is unclear, but it's thought to have originated in Russia, and a psychology student by the name of Philippa Dykin has claimed to be the creator of the game. There are a couple cases of certain specific individuals hosting the Blue Whale Challenge and contacting numerous people to participate in it, but it's generally believed that the Blue Whale Challenge comes from kids administering it to other kids. There's not like a kingpin at the top who's contacting a ton of people to play the Blue Whale Challenge. It's also a pretty common belief that the Blue Whale Challenge was pretty badly sensationalized and posed to be a much bigger problem than it really was by social media outlets and news outlets reporting on it. The amount of deaths that are directly linked to the Blue Whale Challenge is unknown. Trepanning is the practice of drilling holes into someone's head. There's evidence to suggest that trepanning is one of the first surgical procedures ever performed by humans, with evidence of trepanning dating all the way back to the Neolithic era. Trepanning was practiced in ancient China, during the Renaissance and Middle Ages of Europe, pre-Columbian Mesoamerica, but there being a lot of different ideas of what trepanning did. Some people thought putting a hole in your skull could help with headaches, it could help reduce pressure within the head, it could help heal injuries that resulted from direct trauma to the head, or it could even cure mental disorders like epilepsy or schizophrenia by opening up the head and allowing evil spirits to escape. Computers built in video games. I think this is just kind of referring to a trend how within some video games people will build computers within them. For example, people have been able to build functioning computers within Minecraft Craft or Factorio. PowerPoint is Turing complete. So if something is Turing complete, it means that given enough time and memory, it can complete any instructions given to it. So within technicality, Microsoft PowerPoint is Turing complete because if you manipulate and use the animation tool in specific ways, you can actually like build a computer and you could technically make this computer compute any instructions you give to it therefore making it Turing complete. $378,012 EVE Online battle. EVE Online is a multiplayer game where you can spend real life money to buy in-game weapons and spaceships. According to most news outlets who loved covering this expensive online battle, this $378,012 EVE Online battle lasted around 14 hours and both factions in the battle saw enormous losses in their ships. This number, $378,012, is an estimate given based on how much money it would cost to buy the in-game ships that were lost, but it's also likely that many of the ships were bought through in-game grinding and not spending actual money to buy them. Kleptography. For the sake of time, this one's going to be simplified pretty heavily. First, we got to establish what cryptography is. Cryptography is the study of encrypting information using algorithms into encrypted versions of themselves that are no longer readable, and using keys to unscramble and decrypt the information, making it readable again. Cryptography has a ton of different applications, but it's basically the thing that makes it so people can't steal your credit card number. 
number, and so people can't hack into your Facebook account. Kleptography specifically refers to a technique where a backdoor is installed into the crypto system that would allow someone to steal information from the crypto system, such as the key. They could use this key to break the crypto system. It's a very shallow example of how it works exactly, but to truly explain it, I'd also have to explain a ton of different jargon and it's not very interesting, so we're just gonna move on and talk about Alice in Wonderland Syndrome. Alice in Wonderland Syndrome is a neuropsychological condition that leads people to perceive objects around them as much smaller or much larger than they really are, or perceive themselves as much larger or smaller than they really are. There's also a number of other hallucinations that can show up within this disorder, such as hearing sounds louder or quieter than they really are, seeing movements sped up or slowed down, and one of the more extreme hallucinations that some people might experience being something called zoo. Zoopsia. Zoopsia is when people hallucinate swarms of animals such as ants or mice, sometimes even large animals like dogs or even cows. The cause for this disease is unknown, but some potential causes could be head trauma or an infection from the Epstein-Barr virus. And this type of infection to the brain can cause lower levels of blood flow to parts of the brain that are responsible for perceiving senses. It is believed that Lewis Carroll, the writer of the novel Alice in Wonderland, suffered from this disorder and used his experiences from it to write Alice in Wonderland. Also, I'm sick now. Between, like, recording sessions, I got sick, so, hi. Anonymous versus the Church of Scientology. This is referring to how in 2008, a number of people on 4chan organized some protests against the Church of Scientology. At the time, people were making a lot of anti-Scientology YMNTD websites, and a lot of these websites would use logos and service marks that the Church of Scientology technically had copyright ownership over. And the Church of Scientology really did not like these anti-Scientology websites being up, so they issued a cease and desist to YTMND for using copyrighted material from the Church of Scientology without their consent, even though much of the time the copyrighted content that's on these YMTD websites is well within fair use. So for these reasons, plus the other really weird controversies the Church of Scientology is involved in, some groups of people on 4chan organized some protests against the Church of Scientology. Here's footage from March 15th, 2008, where apparently around 200 people showed up and protested in front of a Church of Scientology location in Philadelphia. Shoe nice. So this is referring to a YouTuber who, during the early days of YouTube, was able to grow a following by just kind of eating random stuff, and that was his gimmick. Over the years, though, his fan base has been dwindling as the content he produces isn't really keeping up with what's popular right now and what succeeds on YouTube right now. And he's also been involved in a number of different controversies. He kind of scammed a person who was making thumbnails for him. He had a Patreon where he was asking for money to help solve world hunger, or at least that's what the Patreon said on it. Most people think that the money he he got from this Patreon, he just ended up spending on like alcohol and food. Also just recently a controversy came up, he might have been engaging in activities with someone who is very much not old enough to be engaging in activities with him. I'm being very careful with my words here, please be merciful YouTube, I'm not saying anything that goes against the guidelines. He's had problems over the years with YouTube deleting his channels for violating guidelines, and so he's had to switch his main channel a couple of times now. Firefest. So Firefest was a luxury music festival that took place on the Bahamian island of Great Exuma. The idea of this festival is that people would go to this island for a couple weekends, they would stay in expensive villas and eat expensive food. The organizers of Firefest claimed some pretty prominent names would be performing for it. They said Pusha T was going to be there, Blink-182, Lil Yachty, Bondish, Major Lazer. But upon people actually arriving to this festival and paying for like $12,000 tickets, the festival was a complete disaster. The organizers did not put up villas, instead they put up what were literally disaster relief tents for people to stay in. There was no gourmet food. They were being served just like random sandwiches. Like this is a picture of a cheese sandwich they were served. All the artists and musicians who were supposed to show up for Firefest pulled out. And the organizers barely even communicated that to the attendees. There was really no running water. There was no cell phone service. There was barely any medical personnel. The whole event had been promoted as being like a cashless event. So many of the people who attended it didn't bring any money with them because they thought they'd already paid for everything up front. There was no lighting. <laughs> so people were like having a hard time even finding their way around. And there was a lot of lawsuits pushed against the organizers because people thought they were signing up for this luxury event, but then they just kind of ended up camping on an island and they got scammed into paying for $12,000 tickets. Rainforest. Rainforest was a furry convention that was held between 2007 and 2015. Probably what this entry is referring to is Rainforest 2015. So Rainforest 2015 was held at a Hilton hotel near Seattle, Washington. And throughout the convention, the attendees did a pretty good job at trashing the convention center and the hotel. 
Like, for example, apparently at one point someone went into one of the bathrooms and unscrewed one of the pipes. So the next person who came in and flushed a toilet, the pipes exploded and flooded the bathroom and caused a ton of water damage. For some reason, people were putting towels in the hot tubs and they got caught up in the pump and it destroyed one of them. Some of the furries there were just straight up wearing and using diapers, which made the convention center smell terrible. The whole convention was supposed to be PG-13, but some of those furries were getting kind of out of hand. People were littering. People were like putting furry stickers on walls and doors and stuff. This resulted in thousands of dollars in damages. Some people estimate it was like $100,000 in damages. And it eventually led to the Rainforest Convention being canceled moving forward. There was one planned for 2016, but because of what happened last time, they ended up canceling it. They wanted to go back to this Hilton Convention Center for the 2016 one, but uh, the convention center denied them from attending it, and so they just ended up canceling Rainforest. Ted Kaczynski. Ted Kaczynski is a person that you could spend a lot of time talking about. The basic rundown of him is that Ted Kaczynski was born in 1942, and growing up, he was a really, really smart kid. He was accepted into Harvard University at age 16, and academically speaking, he did really well, but he never seemed to be able to fit in with other people. After graduating from Harvard with a bachelor's in mathematics, he ended up becoming an assistant professor at the University of California at Berkeley, but only after two years of working there, he resigned without really giving much of a reason. Following him leaving his job as a professor, he lived with his parents for two years back in Illinois, but then he ended up moving to a cabin that he'd built out in the woods near Lincoln, Montana. Living in this cabin by himself, he taught himself survival skills and grew his own food. Around this time, Ted Kaczynski started doing a lot of writing, and a lot of his writings revolved around the ideas that modern society is bad, and technology is bad, and humans need to return to a more natural lifestyle. Eventually, Ted Kaczynski started mailing pipe bombs to certain targets across America. His targets included uh, some executives at American Airlines, professors at universities, a guy who was a lobbyist in the timber industry, and a couple other people. Eventually, he sent a 35,000 word essay to a couple media outlets, and he said that if his essay wasn't published, he would continue his bombings. This essay actually was eventually published in the Washington Post, and this is what is referred to as the Unabomber's Manifesto. The essay talks about how modern society is terrible and technology is going to lead to humans' downfall, and we need to look for a more natural lifestyle and leave technology behind. Following the publication of this manifesto, Ted Kaczynski's brother, David Kaczynski, started gaining suspicion that his brother might be the Unabomber and the person behind the bombings. David then went on to report his suspicions of his brother, Ted Kaczynski, being the Unabomber, and it led to an investigation by the FBI, and it eventually led to Ted Kaczynski's arrest. Phantom Limb Syndrome. Phantom Limb Syndrome is a condition where people feel sensations from limbs that they no longer have. Sometimes the sensations they feel is pain, but also a lot of the time it's just other non-painful sensations. It isn't 100% known why this happens, but at this point, it seems like the general consensus is that it has to do something with a miscommunication between your brain and your nervous system and your spinal cord. Disassociative Identity Disorder. So Disassociative Identity Disorder, or DID, is a mental health condition where one person has multiple personality states that they switch between. These different personality states that they switch between can have different behaviors and different skills and different memories, and the switching between these personality states can leave gaps in people's memory. For a while, there was a lot of debate over whether Disassociative Identity Disorder was a legitimate disorder, but it seems like nowadays, although there is still some debate surrounding it overall, it is generally accepted to be a real thing. Disassociative identity disorder is oftentimes sensationalized and romanticized in certain medias. Most of the time, disassociative identity disorder comes about from childhood trauma. Capgras delusion. So Capgras delusion is a pretty rare condition where someone believes that someone very close to them, like a parent, a child, a sibling, or a friend, has been replaced by a completely identical imposter. This condition most commonly shows up in people who've had a stroke or a traumatic brain injury or suffer from some other condition like schizophrenia or by bipolar disorder. No one is entirely sure why Capgras delusion comes about, but there's a couple ideas. The biggest theory of what causes Capgras delusion comes down to the brain's ability to recognize faces and then associate emotions with them. So like typically when you see a face you're familiar with, uh, it kind of brings up some certain feelings and emotions. Like you associate certain feelings and emotions with certain people you know in your life. And Capgras delusion comes about when there's a breakdown in the systems in your brain that associate emotions with certain faces. So so that moving forward, when you see this person's face, no emotions are evoked along with it, so it makes it feel really off. It feels kind of weird. It almost feels like they're not actually the real person, but they're just an imposter of the real person. Also, I'm not sick anymore. 
Perplexity was an ARG organized by a company called Mind Candy. The story of the ARG is that in an alternate reality, there's a place called Perplex City. Perplex City was kind of portrayed as this utopian, futuristic world. And at the Perplex City Academy, there was a mysterious artifact being held there called the Riccata Cube. The Riccata Cube held mysterious and powerful electromagnetic properties. And one night it was stolen from the Perplex City Academy and ended up landing somewhere on Earth. And people who participated in this Perplex City ARG were tasked with finding this Riccata cube somewhere on Earth, and whoever would be first to find the cube would be the winner of the ARG and win 100,000 pounds, which is equivalent to about $130,000 USD. The winner of the ARG was a man by the name of Andy Darley. He found the cube buried in a wooded area off of a highway in Northamptonshire in the UK, and he won 100,000 pounds. The ARG started in April of 2005, and it wasn't completed until February of 2007. There were also collectible cards that were integrated into Perplex City, You'd be able to buy these cards that had riddles and puzzles on them. And if you solved one of these riddles or puzzles, you could go to the Perplex City website and enter the answers to your card and get awarded points to get put on a leaderboard. Some of these puzzle cards, though, were not solved until very recently. Like, there's this card, which the Japanese text on it translates to say, Find me, Satoshi. And the puzzle literally requires you to find this specific guy. And people weren't able to find this guy and solve the puzzle until early 2021. Deep Sea Creatures. The deepest parts of the oceans have really extreme conditions. There's extreme water pressure, little to no light, and so the sea life that resides in these really extreme conditions sometimes seems kind of weird due to the adaptations that they've developed to survive. There's this creature that's been named the Bathyphysa conifera. It's categorized as a sea phonophore, so it's in the same animal group as coral and jellyfish. There's the yeti crab that lives off of hydrothermal vents. There's the spotted handfish that's an Australian deepwater fish that uses its hand-like fins to kind of walk across the sea floor. There are giant isopods, there are bioluminescent jellyfish. It gets pretty weird. Tessie. So this entry is referring to a YouTuber by the name of Playmate Tessie, who's been involved in a long list of different controversies. She pretty infamously made fun of cancer patients for being poor. She's gone on record abusing her cat a couple times. She also just kind of has a tendency to call people poor as an insult. She's really obnoxious. She's really easy to make fun of. She's kind of an internet punching bag in that way. Poland Ball. Poland Balls are these ball-shaped characters that are oftentimes used to make comics about different countries. They're pretty popular amongst a couple different YouTube channels as a tool to help visualize conflicts between countries and how countries interact with one another. There's a pretty popular subreddit dedicated to making comics about them, and they're also commonly used by a couple different webcomic artists in their webcomics. Analog Horror. Analog Horror is a genre of horror that is centered around old television broadcasts and television programs that took place during the era when analog television was most prominent. Probably one of the most prominent and straightforward examples of analog horror is Local 58, which is a YouTube channel centered around the idea that all the videos on this YouTube channel were ripped from some old television broadcast station. And at first, all these videos seem pretty normal and innocent, but once you start watching them more closely, they start taking on a more dark and mysterious tone. Dwarf Fortress Patch Notes. Dwarf Fortress is that game we talked about earlier. And this game has so much going on in it at once and is so complicated and has so many different layers of things that sometimes the patch notes just sound kind of ridiculous. So these are some Dwarf Fortress patch notes from 2007. Stopped children from buying shops. Stopped happy thoughts from sleeping in beds in amazing dining room. Fixed bug where all the local rock turned into sky whenever migrant groups were created anywhere in the world. Made semi-mega beasts get along better with their cave friends. Fixed a problem with blood hanging in the air. Your name the hedgehog. So making Sonic OCs has been a very popular thing for many years now. And it's to this point where there's this joke that if you type in your name in Google followed by the hedgehog, you'll probably find a Sonic OC that's based on your name. Just due to the sheer volumes of Sonic OCs that are out there. Charles Fort is an American writer and researcher who was born in 1876, and he spent much of the latter half of his life writing and researching about events, phenomena, and things that could not be fully explained by accepted science. His most popular books are dedicated to documenting scientific anomalies. The term Fortean is named after him, and it's used to describe events and phenomena that cannot be explained by known science. Examples of Fortean phenomena are sky quakes, Marfa lights, crop circles, 
cryptids, for example, you know, Bigfoot, alien sightings, alien abductions, UFOs, stuff like that. Bart Kira. Akira was a Japanese animated film that was released in 1988, and it was both critically and financially successful, and it's often regarded as a very influential film within the realm of anime. The film is based on a manga from 1982 that is also very successful, and an artist by the name of James Harvey was able to start a project where he organized a bunch of artists to remake Akira with Simpsons characters, and they call the project Bart Kira. It took four years to recreate all six volumes of Akira with Simpsons characters. Most people think it's actually done pretty well. So Simpsons Wave is kind of a genre of video that pairs vaporwave lo-fi music with footage from The Simpsons. Exactly what Simpsons Wave is is kind of hard to pin down, because in some circumstances, Simpsons Wave is pretty clearly a satire. It's kind of trying to make fun of internet culture. You know, pairing The Simpsons with vaporwave is a little bit of a ridiculous concept, and I think in that way, it's kind of trying to make fun of the ridiculousness of internet culture in general. But also, at the same time, under some circumstances, it doesn't seem to be a very satirical thing. Uh, there are a lot of videos on YouTube that display Simpsons Wave-like properties, and there are some with a lot of views. And at least some of these viewers probably get genuine enjoyment out of Simpsons Wave. They are genuinely enjoying it for what it is. They're not enjoying it because it's this ironic thing that they can laugh at. And because Simpsons Wave is in this position where it's kind of a joke and not a joke at the same time, it can be kind of hard to pin down exactly like what the nature of it is. Cooking with hoarders. So there used to be this YouTube channel called Masao Kiss where this guy who lived in this completely rundown, dilapidated apartment that kind of looks like something a hoarder would own would make kind of like cooking tutorial videos. The thing is though, a lot of like the techniques he'd use to cook were just really weird and he'd do things in really weird and stupid ways. Like for example, there's this one video where he's cooking with a pot of oil and then the pot of oil catches on fire. And so what he does is he picks up the pot of oil and then he sets it down in the middle of his kitchen while it's flaming. And then with the flaming pot of oil sitting in the middle of his kitchen, he walks over and turns off the TV because that's a top priority right now. And then he goes back over to the pot of flaming oil and then goes outside and puts it out with snow. Or he's cooking food by just placing it directly on a burner or by trying to like just cook it with a lighter or by placing it on a flaming paper towel. And the recipes he makes are super weird. Shortly after this YouTube channel started getting attention though, it was deleted. At some point, his apartment was doxxed and reported to local authorities because it probably wasn't up to housing code. Luckily though, this YouTube channel that now goes by the name of Cooking with Hoarders has been re-uploading all of his videos. Masao also has a new YouTube channel now called Masao HF, where he's re-uploaded a lot of his old videos and has made a couple new videos too. Of course, a lot of people think that Masao and his YouTube channels are kind of a joke and he's trolling. Although, based on the way that he talks about himself on message boards and how he explains his thought processes, he probably is genuinely like this. There's been people who are kind of close to him that have explained that he had a kind of a neglectful upbringing, and he's made a number of posts on message boards to talking about how he's never been able to really fit in with other people, Lil Kiss. So this entry in the iceberg is a little bit confusing because it says a Lil Kiss, but if you go to the version of this iceberg chart that's on icebergcharts.com, and if you click on this entry, there's a link attached to it that will take you to this website called Lilex. Com. So it makes me think that Lil Kiss is actually a typo for Lilix. This Lilix website is a blog that has a lot of things going on on it, but what it's mainly for is documenting old, weird snippets from magazines, pictures of old advertisements, old comic strips, brochures, catalogs, stuff like that. All Tomorrows. So All Tomorrows is a science fiction blog that kind of covers this narrative about what the future of humanity could look like. So the story of All Tomorrows is that in the future, humans become this interplanetary species that's traveling from planet to planet, trying to colonize the galaxy. And they were doing a pretty good job at it until they eventually encountered this other species called the Q. The Q were far more technologically advanced than the humans. They were masters of genetic and nanotechnological manipulation, and they were on this religious self-imposed mission to conquer and remake the universe as they saw fit. And upon the Q coming into contact with the humans, the Q were offended that humans were also trying to colonize the universe. So as a form of punishment, the Q decided to use their advanced bioengineering technology to divide up humans into a bunch of really weird subspecies. The Q ruled over these weird species of humans for a while, but eventually they moved on. And upon the Q moving on, most of these species just died immediately, but there were a number of them that were able to survive. A lot
lot of the human subspecies that were created by the Q are so far removed from what the human species originally was. For example, the worms were an organism that spent most of its life just digging aimlessly through the dirt looking for food. Or the colonials, which is an organism made pretty much only of skin, muscle, and nerves. And it would grow and spread across a planet in quilt-like fields of human flesh, as the blog puts it. Some of the creatures that were created, though, were far more complex and were far more capable, and many of the different species eventually were able to develop their own societies and cultures. And then the blog goes on to talk about the many different rivalries and alliances that are formed between these different human subspecies. Jamestown. So Jamestown was the first permanent English settlement in the Americas. The early years of Jamestown were not very successful, with the majority of early settlers either dying to disease or starvation, with there even being evidence of there being cannibalism amongst settlers. There was a lot of conflict between the colonists and the native tribes that inhabited the area. A lot of these conflicts resulting in deaths amongst the settlers and the natives. There's so much stuff you could talk about, I don't even know where to start and where to stop. Johnny Otaku. So otaku is a Japanese term used to refer to typically young men who dedicate themselves to technology or some other aspect of pop culture and have poor social skills. But when the term is used in English, it typically refers to people who are obsessed with anime or manga. And in 2004, a film called Otaku Unite was released. And the film was kind of a documentary about anime fans and the kind of culture that anime fans have developed. It's a documentary on otakus. And there's a short section of this documentary about this guy who hosts this anime-themed radio station where he's referred to as Johnny Otaku. This guy shows up a couple different times in this documentary. There's one part where he's hosting his radio show and he's doing his anime radio show thing. There's this other section where he's at this anime convention and he's performing at this cosplay contest. He doesn't win the cosplay contest and he's kind of disappointed about it. And there's this other part of this documentary where he's explaining to an interviewer he's an aspiring voice actor and his goal in life is to be an anime voice actor. And so why this is interesting is at this panel in Texas where a bunch of voice actors who worked for Funimation, Funimation is this company that makes English dubs for animes, and they're holding this panel and there's reports of this guy showing up to this panel and stopping the whole thing and like standing up and begging for a position as a voice actor. And he was saying stuff like, it is my destiny to be the next big voice actor. I've been training for this my entire life, like doing that kind of thing. And the people on the panel had to kind of like tell him to go away and tell him that they weren't just gonna give him a position as a voice actor. But apparently what happened later on at this convention where this panel was being held at, he came up after the panel and cornered one of the voice actresses like up against a wall and was demanding that she help him get a position in the voice acting industry and that she was his only hope to getting in. And it led to him being like kicked out of the convention and banned from going to any conventions in Texas. And even after this, he apparently showed up at the Funimation Studios and was begging for a position still. And then he had to be forcibly kicked out of the Funimation like headquarters Quarters. There's this video of this voice actor who works for Funimation talking about this situation. So this is what this is all based on. In this video, this voice actor says that there's actually footage of Johnny Otaku interrupting the pain, but I can't seem to find it. At this point, it's pretty likely that the person that this voice actor is talking about in this video is Johnny Otaku. She says that the guy that interrupted the panel was wearing an airbender costume, and there's a pretty popular clip of Johnny Otaku doing a presentation in a last airbender costume, and she also refers to this person as Johnny. All right, so we've made some progress on this iceberg, but we're already over an hour and 30 minutes, so I think it's time to call it quits for this episode. You know, if you guys like this video, I'll definitely continue this iceberg. I'll turn this into a multi-part series. Link in the description for the Discord server. We're having a lot of fun over there, and I think you would too. See you later, whenever I return. <laughs>